from the Whiskey Tangent Studios in Marlton, New Jersey, this is Whiskey Tangent News. Hey everybody, this is Ed from the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, here for another episode of Whiskey News. Woo! Joining me, as always, is Scott. Hey, everybody. And we've got some tremendous news stories. We have <laughs> industry news, science and technology, because we always like to be educated. <laughs> uh, interesting environmental take on whiskey and the environment, focusing not on Scott, but on the country of Scotland. Ooh. <laughs> we have true crime. <laughs> and um, feel good story, which we always like to end the news. I remember when you were a kid, you watched the news and it'd be like just nothing but fire and robberies and shootings. And then like the last 10 minutes it have that feel good story before you go to bed right, right after sports and weather. Yeah. When it's like, and on the lighter side, at Sister Charles, <laughs> Sister Charles, <laughs> <laughs> at Sister Betty's school for the um, energetic. <laughs> Had a bake sale to raise money for their annual mission. I don't know. <laughs> You've had like a I have it drunk. Whiskey. I haven't uh, had one sip. Let me try it again. <laughs> I had a feel good story. You know, <laughs> you know when you watch the news when you're a kid, and at the end of it, after the news and the weather, and after all the shootings and the fires, they'd have a feel good story, Scott. Yes, I do. I do. Yeah, like something like you know, the Corpus Christi Carnival came to town, and everybody had a grand old time. Spinning the wheels and riding a Ferris wheel. Lots of wheels at them carnivals. Forget about all the murders right. we told you about and the Forget rapes about the and rapes the and arson. the fire yeah. and, the, and the car crashes. Just remember the last 20 seconds of the news. <laughs> remember geeks at a circus. <laughs> Bearded ladies and what, sword swallowers. What type of circus came to your neighborhood? <laughs> I'm thinking of cotton candy. Sorry, Siobhan. Oh. And uh, water ice. You're talking about a fair, not a circus. No, like, like a carnival. Oh, like, a carnival. You know, like they, they hook well. up the cheesy rides. Every six months, they kill somebody. You know, like, <laughs> some kid, right. So, like the Himalaya falls over and flattens a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah, the right. carnival. Right, right. Gotcha. Oh, Good fun. Good old American fun. <laughs> okay. So it is November 2022, and here's all the news that's fit to drink. Top story before we get to industry news, Ed, Jack Daniels lied to us. No. Yes. Which part? <laughs> I know there's so much they could lie to us about. So last month, we were disappointed to report right. that the long awaited Jack Daniels single malt was to be released only to the global travel retail market. Right. Well, it turns out that that wasn't the whole story. Oh, we said that they would be in duty free shops, right? And, yeah. And in international markets, but not America. Correct. And there was nothing to suggest otherwise in those right. reportings. However, according to an article posted at robreport.com just yesterday, Jack Daniels is in fact releasing its new sherry cask finished single malt in the U.S as an expression of their special release series of whiskeys. And we think this might be because of our reports, Scott. Is that yes, true? Yes, that is true. It's possible. People are saying. It's because they were worried about us spreading a false narrative. Yeah. Or it could be just us demanding that they release. I mean, I don't know how powerful we've become now. <laughs> It could be the fact that we demanded some single malt for the American market, and right. Jack Daniels as a company said, you know what? Those Whiskey Tangent Boys, they got something there. <laughs> we shamed them into it. Right. Yeah. So officially called, and this is a mouthful, Jack Daniels twice-barreled special release American single malt finished in Oloroso sherry casks. Whiskey Tangent Selection. <laughs> <laughs> nope. No. So uh, it is what it says it is, uh, made from 100% malted barley from a single distillery, aged for a minimum of four years in new charred American oak barrels, and then given a secondary maturation for an additional two years in Spanish Oloroso sherry cast from Antonio Paez Labato <laughs> Cooperage in Jerez de la Frontera Spain <laughs> bottled at cast strength between 106 and 108 the new release will be available this month for $70 in the new 700 milliliter bottle size tasting notes are reportedly bananas of course dark chocolate tart tannins young wood ripe dark <laughs> berries malt and roasted espresso beans <laughs> Young Wood. <laughs> Young Wood. It sounds like one of those films in the back of the <laughs> blockbuster when you were a kid. Right. That your dad would jerk you away from. Get away from that section. He did what? Would jerk you away from the Young Wood section. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what my father said to do. Just leave it alone. Right. Oh, okay. So in industry news, finally getting to the actual news. Yeah. From the Whiskey Raiders, two major U.S. craft distilleries have been purchased in the past month. 
First, coming less than three months after acquiring a 15% stake in Howlerhead Banana Bourbon, which coincidentally we just tried last week on our last episode, Italy-based Campari Group announced late last month that it had reached an agreement to purchase 70% of Kentucky-based Wilderness Trail Distillery yeah. for $420 million. Said Campari Group CEO Bob Coons Consowitz, we are very excited to partner with the fast-growing Wilderness Trail brand to further expand our bourbon offerings, priming it to become Campari Group's second major leg after the aperitif portfolio. Wilderness Trail founders Shane Baker and Pat Heist also released a statement saying, our state-of-the-art production facilities, coupled with their worldwide distribution, first-class marketing, and expertise across multiple spirit categories is a win-win situation for both parties. Mm -hmm. Under the terms of the agreement, Campari will purchase the remaining 30% of Wilderness Trail in 2031. Wow, that's interesting. They sold their company in stages. Yeah. And I will point out that Campari outbid Scott and I, our move to take over, <laughs> by about just $421 million more than we had to offer. Yeah, $419.9 million. Right. They beat us. They beat us yeah. by. We did make a move for it. 100000 We yeah. tried, you know. Yeah, we jacked it up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, we won't even buy the most expensive bottle Wilderness <laughs> Trail puts out. <laughs> Our cheap asses. I know. But I walked by Elijah Craig, 18 year in the store, and I'm like, oh, 198 yeah, yeah, I got a lot of whiskey to buy this month. I can't afford a $200 bottle right now. No, no. That's a luxury. That's right. So uh, the second one, just a few days after that deal was announced, Diageo, the enormous spirits conglomerate, announced that it had acquired the Texas distillery Balconies for an undisclosed sum. Said Diageo North America President Claudia Schubert, the Balconies team are true innovators and pioneers in the emerging American single malt and Texas whiskey movements, and their super premium plus whiskeys are highly complementary to our portfolio. This acquisition is in line with our strategy to acquire high growth brands in fast growing segments, mm -hmm. and we look forward to working with the Balconies team to support further growth for these world-class whiskeys. The move comes after the super premium whiskey category grew 13.3% year over year during the past five years, and after Balconies had won more than 500 national and international tasting awards. Well, they were innovative until they forced their founder and creative power out of the company. Yeah. I won't say that. Yeah. Second of all, I will say that we hated four out of five Balconies yes. that we drank. We did. So we're not Balcony fans as a whole, though they do have some home runs, like their True Blue is delicious. I haven't tried every single expression they put out, but... Yeah. I mean, it is popular, though. Uh, not uh, popular I mean, with I, us. I'm certainly, I am certainly not the end of the be-all with Texas whiskey, but... Right. Uh, all right, so the last story in the industry news, a kind of surprising one. I didn't really know where to put this, and you'll see why when I read the title. From the UK's Daily Record, Vladimir Putin approves oh the smuggling of whiskey into Russia. How does he have time for something like this? Go ahead. <laughs> what? In an attempt to circumvent export bans from governments across the world who have stopped or severely limited trade over his invasion of Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin has approved a secret order allowing popular products to be imported into Russia via a process called Parallel Import, also known as the Gray Market. Mm -hmm. Among the 200 or so brands on the Parallel Import list are several whiskeys, including scotches like Johnny Walker, Macallan, Lagavulin, Bowmore, and Akatoshan, but also American brands such as Jack Daniels and Jim Beam. Of course, it's not all alcohol. Cars, chemicals, household appliances, game consoles, clothes, shoes, and toys would also be allowed to flow in from countries that are still doing business in Russia like China, India, and Turkey. A spokesman for the Scottish Whiskey Association said, although scotch is one of many exports that have been affected by the ongoing conflict, our immediate concern remains the welfare of our industry colleagues in the war-torn region. So basically, he's like, can anybody get me a bottle of Knob Creek? <laughs> if any of y'all can get me a bottle of Knob Creek, uh, yeah. I don't know why he became Southern all of a sudden, <laughs> why Putin became Southern. If any of y'all can get me a bottle of Knob Creek, maybe the 12-year, <laughs> maybe a store pick, find a way to the Kremlin. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's just a weird story. I happened upon it, and I was like, I have to report on this. It's just so strange. Uh, it's either industry news or true crime. Yeah, I thought about true crime, but true crimes were like tragically funny, yeah. and this is just kind of tragic. Tragic and confusing. <laughs> yeah. So in science and technology news. All right. From sciencenews.org, there may be a literal gold standard for testing a whiskey's age. Mm. I thought this was super interesting. All right, lay it on me. All right, so for hundreds of years, the only way to determine how much a whiskey aged in the barrel was to pour out some and taste it. Day after day, week after week, year after year, a process that is at worst tedious and at best more art than science. Much more recently, laboratory assays have been developed that can measure agedness by detecting flavorful chemicals called congeners. But such analyses can be time-consuming and expensive. However, in a recent article published in the journal of ACS Applied Nanomaterials titled, 
involved growth of plasmonic nanoparticles for aging cast matured whiskeys, researchers have successfully demonstrated a way to reveal how much flavor a whiskey has taken from the barrel that's both faster than taste testing and far cheaper than lab results by using ions of gold. Okay. Building on past research that showed that certain compounds can trigger gold ions in a solution to coalesce into ultra tiny gold nuggets, a group of researchers from the University of Glasgow's School of Chemistry mixed solutions containing less than a penny's worth of gold into different whiskey blends. Within minutes, the ions and congeners reacted to form nanoparticles with varying sizes and shapes that caused the spirits to turn different colors, ranging from amber and red to blue and purple. The stronger the color and the quicker that color arises, the more aged the whiskey is. The researchers believe that not only can their gold ion test be performed easily on site at distilleries to determine when a whiskey may be ready to be tasted and what flavors it might contain, but it could also serve as spectrographic fingerprints unique to each whiskey batch and barrel, which could in turn be useful for cataloging, blending, and thwarting would be counterfeiters. Wow, I mean, that's crazy. Isn't that cool? Really cool. So basically, by doing a chemical test, they can determine how far along in the aging process of whiskey is. Yeah. And like when I was reading this, I was like, well, are they going to like replace master distillers and stuff? But it really wasn't. It was more no. of like a helpful tool for master distillers. Right. It doesn't create the blend. It just tells you where it's at. Right. Oh, uh, no, robots will replace all of us at one point. Well, uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> at some point, yeah. yeah. We'll just be like, uh, what was the movie? Uh, Wally. We're oh, yeah. all just big, happy and chubby, just sitting in the giant chairs and just consuming food and media. What do you mean? We'll be. Oh, yeah. Shit. Sounds like a good weekend to me. <laughs> me too. So in environmental news. Yes. From the Herald Scotland, Beam Centauri announces major peat restoration project. Mm -hmm. mm, looking to create a more sustainable system to extract the peat that so many Scotch brands use to halt the fermentation of their malted grains, Lafroy and Bowmore's parent company, Beam Centauri, which I didn't know that Beam Centauri owned them, is providing almost half a million dollars of funding to restore and regenerate peatlands at the Airds Moss Reserve in East Ayrshire, Scotland. In total, Beam Centauri has committed to the restoration and conservation of 1,300 hectares hectares of peatlands in Scotland by 2030, enough to produce the same amount of peat that it harvests every year hmm. in making its Scotch whiskies. And by 2040, they're aiming to restore twice that amount. In recent years, the harvesting of peat moss has been criticized by environmental groups, climate scientists, and even distillers themselves, who respectively have recognized its effect on wildlife, higher CO2 levels, and a possible peatless future for the Scotch whiskey industry. I mean, you don't think about the process of how much peat is being used. and Yeah. Does that bring us to our field trip? Yeah. All right, we had a Whiskey Tangent field trip last week. <laughs> you did. Whiskey Tangent field trip. Field trip. Field trip. Field trip. We went to um, a uh, whiskey tasting and book signing and a night with David Broom, who is a expert on spirits in general, Scotch whiskey especially. Yeah. And he was in Manhattan at a place called the Brandy Library. It's a beautiful building, and a great place, just hundreds of bottles of whiskey. And we um, we enjoyed his uh, tour of Scotland, kind of telling us about the different regions. We tried six different scotches. Yeah. Before that, though, we, you know, we, ha we got there early. So we went to a place called Walker's to start off, which is this is all in Tribeca area area of manhattan that's really funny we had a funny experience in there i didn't catch the bartender's name because it's really crowded but me and scott wanted a manhattan you know because we're corny we want to have a manhattan in manhattan <laughs> yeah. you know i mean we're just morons well, why not and so um out of curiosity based on our experience with vermouth go back and listen to our does your vermouth for matter episode which mm. is very interesting episode 45 the one that won was the the carpana antiqua which is a very very good italian vermouth it's good stuff and so I walked up to the bartender and I asked him, hey, uh, <laughs> which vermouth are you going to use? He looked at me straight in the eye and he, without breaking eye contact, he goes, the only vermouth you can use. And he reached back into the rack and brought out Carpana Antiqua and he put it back in and he goes, you just meet me and you call me a savage and he <laughs> walks away. And that's the type of personality I miss not being in New York a lot. Right. And then we went to Bubby's and Joey was the yeah. uh, the bartender. A nice and, kid. Yeah. Young guy. Late, yeah. late 20s probably. Mm -hmm. And we had our friends who went with us for the night, Jen and Katie. Katie's married to Matt who appeared on our Whiskumentary, our right. last one. Yeah. And uh, Katie's been in the liquor industry for many, many years. And she's the catalyst that got us to go to the tasting because her company she's presently with had one of their scotches in there. Right. And then we went to the event. They had nice butler hors d'oeuvres. We had like a little filet and some sushi. And Just a beautiful place. It's it was like, really well done. Picture like a really high-end library, yeah. but the books were whiskey. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, we might post a couple pictures of. Yeah, yeah. If you follow us on Instagram, you probably saw a couple already, but we'll post more well, when the episode comes out. Yep. So David Broom was a very easy talker, great storyteller. He, by his own admission, says he's got the best life ever. He's basically for 20 years. He's been yeah. paid to drink whiskey and spirits and talk about it. And he wrote a very interesting book. We got a copy of it. Yeah, it's called A Sense of Place, A Journey Around Scotland's Whiskey by Dave Broom. It's focused on whiskey, not only just being a business and a spirit, but also part of the community. Basically, a lot of the Scottish distilleries are in small, remote locations, and whole towns have built up around them. Yeah. And so what we drink as a nice end to our week is somebody's livelihood. Like, it's the center of their town. Yeah, yeah. And so it's really interesting, like, something you don't stop to think about, the human factor of the liquor industry. Right. Yeah, I have the list of the scotches if you want to talk about yes, it. Yes, please. So the first one is a Brooklady single malt scotch whiskey, Bear Barley, 2012 version. It is 100 proof. Yeah. One reason I think we liked them better is they weren't 80 proof. They had a little bit of a gumption. Yeah. And this wasn't 10-year <laughs> Isla scotch, yeah. and it wasn't very peaty or smoky. It was so balanced. It had just a little bit of peat, just a little bit of smoke, yeah. just a little bit of sweetness, just a little bit of spice. I, well, I'm not saying it was the best one, but it was definitely one of the most balanced scotches. And if somebody was going to get into scotch for the first time, the Brulati is a great way to go. Yeah, it's really nice. The second one was the Highland Park. This was a cask pick from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, who was running the show there. This yeah. was called Life Affirming. Was it 20 years? 20 years aged. It was a 112.4. I will say, for a 20 year, I think, remember, we didn't feel it was that amazing. No. You know, you don't drink a lot of 20 year whiskeys. So you get a shot for a 20 year, you're like, oh, here it comes. And it's like, all right, I kind of like the brew a little bit better at 10. Yeah. Uh, the third one was a Kleinelish, another cask pick called The Art of Etiquette, aged uh, 17 years. Yeah. The fourth one was a Mortlock, aged 16 years. That's a space side yeah. one. That was a little lower proof, around what it normally is, an 86.8. But it was a distiller's dram. The distiller had chosen this bottle, mm. and it was old. So it actually was the it, most smoky, I think, as I remember. It was quite good. Wasn't my favorite, but I could appreciate how complex it was. It was a very special whiskey. Yeah, the fifth one was a Glenfiddich, a bourbon barrel reserve, aged 14 years. Now it was 15. Oh, that's right. It was 15. The program said 14, but it, that bottle they brought was 15. Right. <laughs> I think it was 80 proof. We didn't really like it very much. No, nah, it was Glenfiddich. We've done that. You see my We've tasting notes? There. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a scribble. It's like, nah, I didn't like this. Yeah. Uh, and the last one was an Arden American Scotch malt whiskey. This was a, another cast pick by them called Smoky, Salty, and Malty. This was the highest proof one. This was 123 was proof, good. but it was only aged five years. Yeah. It was really good, it though. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was for five and a half years. It was really good yeah and once again the main reason we went on this journey was because we know that scotland is the motherland of whiskey and we're not as versed in that as other spirits so yeah we see a chance to learn about six very unique scotches from a guy who's an expert and he told us basically what got it to taste the way it tasted and mm-hmm. from the region and what we should be looking for in the scotches i mean it was a really educational night for us as well as enjoyable yeah it really was and it, it was very interesting because he went back in history like to yeah. the very first people like in the extreme northern parts of scotland orkney islands just a great trip uh that we just kind of made on the spur of the moment yeah and then afterwards we went down the street it was a rare sports night for scott and i as we watched the phillies in the world series on one tv and the eagles playing thursday night game yeah against houston we went one and one yeah eagles Uh, won phillies lost a tough three two we had to win that one and as you all as you all know we we, uh we came up short the houston pitching staff is one of the best i've ever seen oh yeah absolutely they were probably a year or two early to the postseason in the world series we were all kind of expecting maybe they could take a run next year yeah yeah this was a surprise and i think we weren't ready because we didn't pick up that extra high level reliever and we didn't pick up that bat for the bench oh yeah and we had no one come off the bench to scare anybody Exactly. We didn't have any depth on right. offense or pitching or defense. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and it's nice to see Houston winning a World Series without cheating. That's good. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming they didn't cheat, but well, uh, yeah. Right. But let's, hey, good for them. Yeah. Good for you, Houston, you soulless bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Screw it. I don't like your whiskey and I don't like you. Wow. Keep your Texas whiskey and keep your cheating Texas baseball team. There. I said it. Wow. So our seven <laughs> Houston fans are done with us. That's good. So perfect category to come up right now. <laughs> True crime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so from MyNorthwest.com out of Seattle, Washington, man flees accident with child and a bottle of whiskey. Good move. (laughs) Police in the city of Lakewood, Washington, have reported that an individual stole a Mini Cooper and proceeded to drive through the repaving project for the Northgate Road roundabout. Oh, not the Northgate. You know how that gets down uh, there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what, wait, what state is this? Is it, uh, Washington, yeah. I've never been in Washington. Uh, breaking through barricades into freshly poured cement and getting themselves stuck. 
<laughs> Look, there's a picture. Hold on. I, I, <laughs> it's a mini coupe up the cement, three quarters way up the tire. Yeah. The man then attempted to flee the scene, shoes caked with cement, carrying his young child in one hand and a bottle of whiskey in the other. Please tell me you have the brand. No, oh, I don't. Shit, I would have made something up. Yeah. A city inspector followed the suspect and called 911. Once police showed up, the man was taken into custody. Crews are working to repave the project. I would have been gunning that bottle of whiskey till they put the cuffs on me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, he stole a Mini Cooper with his child. I'm going to say it's a James E. Pepper bourbon. <laughs> no, maybe it's a Balconies. Yeah. <laughs> From the Whiskey Raiders again, intoxicated college student found covered in blood after lighting a car on fire. Oh, my God. You, that definitely sounds like Balconies to me. <laughs> Texas A&M police say there Kobe Hunter McAdoo was found at the George Bush. I'm sorry, what is his name? Kobe Hunter McAdoo. Wow. <laughs> was found at the George Bush Presidential Library Complex. <laughs> Just before 3.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning without shoes, covered in blood and appearing very intoxicated and highly emotional. The 20-year-old college student had apparently consumed sleep medication and whiskey in his dorm, then walked to the library and using hand sanitizer and a lighter, set fire to a vehicle in the parking lot, broke into another vehicle, and attempted to set a fire inside the building after throwing a large metal block through a window. (laughs) Released on bonds totaling $41,000, McAdoo faces charges of public intoxication, burglary, and arson, with investigators saying that additional charges were possible. An Al Gore or John Kerry fan? like <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh, Screw you, George Bush! It seems really random to attack the George Bush Library. It's so random. <laughs> I think it, it might be at Texas A&M, so I, right. I don't know. I think he knew what he was doing. Maybe. And the last of the true crime, and then we'll have a feel-good story. Okay. Okay. So from Texumus.com out of Wichita Falls, oh. mom charged after two year old wanders into road for help. Hmm. Yeah. Iowa Park resident Ashton Parsons was charged with child endangerment for leaving her children unsupervised after she passed out from drinking. This one, I do have the whiskey. Thinking she was dead, her children ages two and four left the home to seek help, after which the two-year-old boy was nearly run over by a pickup truck that slammed on its brakes to avoid running him over. After neighbors called police and officers arrived at the scene, the four-year-old girl told them that her mommy was inside the house and looked dead and scary. <laughs> but when- yeah, I've been there, sweetheart. I have been there. You normally pull through. I'll tell you that. So far, I've pulled yeah. through every well, time. Well, she was four. She didn't know. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when they found Parsons, she was alive, passed out on her bed with a strong odor of alcohol on her breath when they roused her she admitted to drinking nearly an entire bottle of maker's mark oh <laughs> no shade maker's mark it wasn't your fault it wasn't your fault thank god she didn't get their cast strength she might have been <laughs> she might have actually died right the 46 cast strength watch out for that i think i want to drink a bottle of maker's mark next weekend just to me. see yeah Let's see if they might can do yeah so you figure how many shots like 15 shots yeah i'll get up at like i don't know, like eight and i'll just do a shot an hour for 15 hours oh my god i don't think i'd get that drunk really a shot an hour. Yeah, I think, oh, I, I think no. I'll be just like I am right now. Yeah, then that's fine. You'd have to do it like a shot every 20 minutes. I, yeah, so if I did it in five hours, that'd be three shots an hour. Yeah, you'd be pretty drunk after that. Yeah, five ounces an hour. Yeah. I'd fight the good fight for three hours. <laughs> yes, and then it would catch up <laughs> It would start to catch up with me. <laughs> uh, it's like just the worst version of the power hour of bit, but in college. You ever exactly. do that? Yeah. Uh, was a shot of beer a minute for an hour? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So you end up drinking five beers in an hour. Yeah. Wow, you, it really catches up with you. I got to tell you that. It really does. I started doing the power half hour. Yeah. I did a shot every 30 seconds yeah. for a half an hour, and I got about 15 minutes, and I just vomited clear beer right out of me. Like, it just nice. came right out of right. me. Nice. Your stepbrother Joe was there, and he was like, you probably could have put your cup right under it and drank it, because it was the same <laughs> thing going down. Like, it wasn't digested. Oh, no, I, it wasn't. Yeah, that's the best thing about beer. I, I've thrown up beer that was still cold. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sure. But oh, that, that good. Oh, memories of the- <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the feel-good story, I mean, I mean, if that I mean, wasn't feel-good was enough. Feel, what could be better than that, Scott? Yeah. Throwing up beer all over yourself. <laughs> all right, so this is similar to the one we had a couple months ago about the old person turning 100. Yeah. Yeah. So from uh, WAFB9 News in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, World War II vet attributes whiskey and women for making it to his <laughs> milestone birthday. <laughs> 
The Baton Rouge Navy Club recently recognized a local centenarian, Chief Petty Officer Frank Massans, a World War II Navy veteran who turned 100 years old last month. According to Navy Club members, Massans spent 30 years in the U.S. Navy serving on 13 ships, including the U.S. Olympia, the ship that returned the body of the unknown soldier to the United States. Wow, random fact. Yeah. When asked his secret to living to 100, old Frank replied, when I was younger, I chased the ladies and I drank hard liquor. There you go. Sometimes he chased hard ladies and then he tried to liquor. Wow. The Olympia was the flagship of Roosevelt's Great White Fleet. It's that one that's docked in Philadelphia, the, the, ah. the 1898 battleship. Yeah. That's the original Olympia. Cool. That's the original one. Oh, cool. I have to give a shout out to a guy that he's no longer with us. A buddy of mine, Sam, World War II vet, fought in the Battle of Bulge. Oh, wow. told me a lot of stories I could share with y'all. But when I was speaking with him, he was 88. You know, I said, what do you do for fun? He goes, like, oh, like, you know, he goes, once a week, I go dancing. Huh. I go, 88. I said, you still go dancing? He goes, yep. I go, yeah, yeah, then what? He goes, oh, then we have couch time. <laughs> Love it. And I have to tell you, he was a, a great guy. Yeah, we're recording this just a couple days after uh, Veteran, Veterans Day. Veterans Day. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I'll, salute. Scott, I'll give a toast all right. to all the veterans out there. You know, I've never had the pleasure of serving, but my father did. And Scott, your father did as well. Yeah. Unless you've served, you don't really understand what it's like. And so we don't, but we appreciate all that veterans have done and given to this country. I don't think you could put a price on the valor that's been displayed by many of the men and women who've served this country. Absolutely. Cheers. Uh, so, uh, new whiskeys, right? New whiskeys. Can I do it first or last? Uh, go ahead, do it. So I was in Total Wine, and they had something that has been getting a little bit of a buzz recently, which is from Old Forester, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. It's a single barrel, barrel strength, distillery selection, and it's 126.6 proof. <laughs> the mash bill is their traditional mash bill. I think it's 72 corn, 18% rye, 10% malted barley. We've been drinking it the whole episode. I'm starting to feel it now. Because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's hitting hard, but it is really delicious. The one we have is so dark. It's like it's got a cherry, almost looks like a Manhattan with a red tinge to it. Yeah, like it's, a, it's super dark. So if you have a chance to get the Old Forester single barrel, barrel uh, strength distillery selection. This is a barrel that's handpicked by the master distiller for release. And there's not that many that are out. Uh, so uh, Basil Hayden has released two new expressions they've been active yeah the basil hayden tenure this is their fifth annual release of its tenure expression 80 proof of course the msrp is 70 oak is balanced by caramel sweetness and rye spice and then they have a red wine cask finish completely new it was a blend of their classic basil hayden high rye mash bill bourbon and then they took bourbon that was partially aged in a california red wine casks and blended them together right uh 80 proof msrp is 60 layered on complex with ripe cherries dried fruit vanilla and charred oak similar to the way legion was prepared scott mm, which, yes which is some straight whiskey and then some mixed with that japanese red wine and blended by uh, uh, uh sukiyama yeah <laughs> i can't remember his sukiyama? name sukiyama yeah the master distiller at uh, suntory me. um so the next one is buffalo trace antique collection is out okay the annual release of this consisting of once again five whiskeys the sazerac 18 year rye which is 90 proof and 99 dollars Mm -hmm. The Eagle Rare 17 year, which is 101 proof. These are all $99 uh, MSRP. Uh, William Luru Weller Weeded Bourbon. No age statement, but it says it's about 10 years. It's 124.7 proof. The Thomas H. Handy Rye, which we've actually had on the podcast. Yep. That's a six year. It's a 130.9 proof. And a George T. Stag back after not being included last year. This is 15 years and five months. 138.7 proof. They're all 100? Well, their MSRPs are, yes. I mean, that's still amazing. Yeah. Uh, so next up is the Blackened Times West Henderson. So this is the second release of their Masters of Whiskey series. The first was a collaboration with Willet, finished in Madeira casks. This is a six-year Kentucky bourbon finished in Port Wine cask in collaboration with Wes Henderson, co-founder of Angel's Envy. Mm. It's 117 proof. MSRP is 140. Pear, honey, chipotle, cinnamon, vanilla, barn hay, and walnut. <laughs> Barn hay. Yeah. This guy, I guess it's got a grassy note in it. It's a legit tasty note. It's just yeah. not one I've heard a lot. No. And I think it's interesting. This is something that I've noticed that I find interesting because I just said that. <laughs> is that. Wait, is it interesting? It is interesting. Mm. Is that as the demand. <laughs> the crickets will decide. <laughs> as, no. As the <laughs> demand for whiskey grows, distilleries are, for the most part, are standing by bowel strength and their calf strength and their higher proof. The last one you just said was how hot? Oh, uh, 117. Right. So, I mean, they could drop that to like 95 and put a lot more bottles out, you know? 
right? The distilleries are respecting the fact that there is a huge market for the upper proof. And Scott and I have always said, if you want to charge us upwards of hundred dollars a bottle, you got to give us proof. Like the one I bought tonight, the old Forester single barrel barrel strength was 126.6. So that gives us a lot of room to put some water on it, to drink it and make it last. So while it's ninety dollars, it's really like a bottle and a half compared to something that's ninety proof, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no way you drink one hundred twenty six proof whiskey as fast as a ninety proof whiskey. At least no. I don't. Oh, agreed. Uh, if you're charging over a hundred, it better be proofed over a hundred. That's my rule. Right. All right. So the next one is Booker's, a new release from them, the twenty twenty three oh three Kentucky Tea Batch. This one is nicknamed. <laughs> The batch is named after Booker No's yeah. signature drink, which he referred to as Kentucky Tea, one part bourbon, four parts water, which he would enjoy with dinner. Aged seven years and four yeah. months and 14 days. That's 126.5 proof. The MSRP is 90. Uh, robust vanilla and caramel notes, slightly smoky with deep and complex flavors of vanilla, nuts, and oak. Installed today for 114. 114. Almost bought it. Though. If it was actually 90, would you have bought the Booker's over the old Porter? No, because this is one and done. I know I can get the Booker's. Okay. All right. So the next one is Chicken Cock Chanticleer. We talked to Greg Snyder previously, and he actually told us that uh, we might be able to get some of this, but then they didn't send any. So, Did you reach out? Uh, no. Well, let's reach out to him. Well, this is a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in cognac barrels, uh, bottled in a Prohibition era chicken cock replica apothecary style bottle and sealed in a collectible commemorative tin, similar to what was used during Prohibition. Only 32 barrels have been produced. The mash bill is 70% corn, 21% rye, 9% malted barley. There's no age statements, but it's over four years. It's 112 proof. And the MSRP is $500. Yeah, we might not get any of that. <laughs> Yeah, right. That's what I mean. All right. So the next one is Hirsch Cask Strength Cognac Barrel Finished Bourbon. This is a six-year bourbon finished in 30-year-old Hein Cognac XO barrels. Hein has been making cognac for 256 years. So in your face, Hennessy. Only 9,000 bottles are available. It is 72% corn, 13% rye, 15% malted barley, 127 proof. The MSRP is 200. Dark plums, rich baking spices, mild cinnamon heat, and black cheese. Cherries. Well, I don't know if it's worth it, but we had a Hirsch two weeks ago. Mm, delicious. Over at Doug's was 138 proof, I think. Yeah, it was really high. Six year again. So I know what the six year Hirsch can taste like. I bet the mash bill is similar. This was not finished in cognac barrels. It was finished in my mouth. And I have to tell you, <laughs> it was delicious. Yeah, it was really good. We'll go back and listen to Doug's Vault. Doug's Vault it's is a fun a time. Gem of whiskeys. Each one was an adventure. It's a great episode. Here's another brand that we tried, I think, for the first time at Doug's the Peerless. Yeah. They have just released an absinthe barrel finished rye. What? Yeah. What? So this is their third annual release of their absinthe barrel finished rye, first release in 2020. This is 110.7 proof. The MSRP is $134 on their website. <sighs> Candied licorice, spicy oak, cinnamon, orange zest, sweet grasses, rye grain, leather, tobacco, finishing like a Sazerac cocktail. I got to tell you. I want it. I, I got to tell it. you. 134. Yes. 110 proof. Yes. If we can find it, that's our Christmas present to ourselves. Absolutely. I'm doing it. I'm Ooh, doing it. If we can get this, we could do it on our Christmas Eve yeah. episode yeah. that we do. All right. So the next one we have is the Redwood Empire. Have yeah. you had a lot of Redwood Empire No, stuff? I've had it once in a bar, but I don't remember it at all. Okay. So they've released three. Uh, they call it their cast strength collection. They're getting bigger and bigger. I see more and more of them on the shelves. Yeah. So this is the Emerald Giant Rye, the Pipe Dream Bourbon, and the Lost Monarch Rye Bourbon Blend. Blend. So the Emerald Giant Rye is a 94% rye, 5% malted barley, 1% wheat, four to six what? years aged, 116.4 proof. It's $70. For 70, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. See, it's funny. If he had said 88, I'd be like, nope. Right, right. I mean, I'll get a Baker's for 65. Yeah. I saw old Ezra in the store today for 61. Mm -hmm. Lucky I have enough. Mm -hmm. I would have bought one. <laughs> you know my rule on that. That's right where I buy it. Yeah. But I already had two. And then I think one's open too. So, you know. You have so many rules. Do you write them down or are they just no, in your it's, head? It's, it's in born, Scott. It's in born. <laughs> I'm like a fine tuned machine when it comes to buying whiskey. You're a whiskey savant. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> uh, the next one is the Pipe Dream Bourbon. This is 74% corn, 20% rye, 4.5% malted barley, and 1.5% wheat. So it's a four grain. It's aged four years, 116.8 proof, uh, also $70. Cedar, peach nectar, honeyed pears, mocha, leather, and sweet tobacco. 
the Lost Monarch Rye Bourbon Blend is basically those two mm-hmm. mixed together in a 55% rye, 45% bourbon mix. Right, this Scott did it with two glasses on his table. Yeah, right. and of course, because I'm a nerd, I figured out the mash bill from that. So it's 61% rye, 33% corn, 5% malted barley, and 1% wheat. It is 117.2 proof. Again, $70. Nutmeg, baked pears, holiday spices, spearmint, black pepper, and apricot. I think, that, I think that's the one I would be in for. I think I yeah, the best the of both worlds. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. doing that. Sure. I, I agree. I mean, it's the highest proof for the money. Yeah, yeah, and it's also, you know, I'm getting a little flavor of both what they have, right? Right. But I bet they did it like we do. They probably were tasting the bourbon and the rye, and then one guy dumped them together and goes, bro, <laughs> this is fire. That's what I do <laughs> all the time. All right, so just for the sheer audacity of this next one, I've included oh. it because... It's MSRP is ridiculous. All right. Teeling 32 year purple muscat wine finish. Oh, wow. 32 years. Irish single malt finished in Portuguese purple muscat French oak casks for an additional four years. It's 107.4 proof. Ripe red fruits and caramel, chocolate walnuts, vanilla cream, dried cherries, plums, figs, and warm dry wood tannins finishing with woody spice, caramel fudge, and milk chocolate. That sounds fucking amazing. Yes, it does. MSRP? Um, let me think. Uh, Six hundred dollars. Thirty-five hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. I just included it for the sheer audacity of it. <laughs> wow. uh, we will never get to taste wow. that. But you know what can you do? Okay, so we got two more. The Whistle Pig Boss Hog Nine mm-hmm. is out. It's called Siren Song. This is a single barrel, barrel strength, straight rye whiskey aged 13 years in American oak, first finished for seven days in Greek fig nectar casks, and then another seven days in barrels that once contained tentura, a spicy herbal citrus Greek liqueur. Mm. Its proof varies between 102.5 and 106.2. Its MSRP is $600. I've already seen it on the secondary market for 1000 The name Siren Song hails from the mythological sirens who lured sailors to their doom with their entrancing voices. Each bottle features one of the nine sirens in the form of a bespoke pewter topper. Its tasting notes are orange blossom, dried fruit, brown sugar, cinnamon, clove, and black cherry, finishing with jammy fig and rye spice. All right, well, I got one more. You got one? I got one more, too. What do you have? Well, you go, and then I'll do the last one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Crown Royal released a 29-year aged whiskey. Damn. 92 proof. Rich taste of warm baking spice, orchard fruits, oak, Canadian rye, hints of vanilla. It's only available in 10 states. Arizona, California, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania. So we can go over the Ooh. bridge and get it. Okay. And Texas, but we might not want to get it because its MSRP is $399. <laughs> and I, the cheapest I saw it online was for $499. So. Wow. I mean, I would love to taste it because I'm a Crown Royal fan. I would love to taste it. I wouldn't buy a whole bottle. Right. I'll buy a $30 drink of it somewhere. Yeah, because yeah, it's special. I, yeah, if yeah. I, yeah, I'll try it. And we'll talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, it's yeah, worth it. Let's do that. So the last entry I have, Wyoming Whiskey. We did one yeah, of yeah. their expressions yeah. on the secondary market. Their white label weeded one, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they put out three different expressions. The Outrider? Coming the up? Outrider, okay. Straight American Whiskey, the Single Barrel, and their Barrel Strength. So the Outrider, Straight American Whiskey, is their sixth annual release. It's five years aged, 100 proof. MSRP is 75. Yeah. The single barrel is the ninth annual release, five years, 96 proof, and that's $99. And the barrel strength is the first barrel strength since 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's also five years. Uh, 122.4 proof. The MSRP is 300. Yeah, but unfortunately it's, for that. Well, it's funny. Yeah. But Nash had a single barrel calf strength of that. Okay. And it was not over $70. Okay. But that was of the white label, the weeded one, which might yeah, be a yeah, cheaper yeah. mash bill for them. But I didn't get it because I honestly simply did not care for it. And so... It didn't make the cut for me. However, I still bought a regular Wyoming white label, which is a great weeded bourbon. Yeah. And and that's like $40. And a good price. All right, so that's it for the new whiskeys that you can buy this month. Uh, The last thing that we do is what's coming up on the podcast. Next week is 1125, so there's no podcast. That's uh, right. Day after Thanksgiving. Catch up, everybody. Catch up. (laughs) On the 1st of December, episode 60, a cocktail episode, we're trying to get Anders, Marty, and Rachel on the show. They haven't been in studio in a year. Yeah. On the 8th of December, we've been reached out by Blue Note, probably going to do their uncut and whatever else they send us, uh, and an interview with the president and COO, uh, I think his name is Logan. 
And then on the 15th, we're right back here doing the December news. That's right. Keeping everybody up to date. Yeah. So uh, I think that's it. That's all I got. What do you got, Ed? We covered all the good stuff today. Our trip to New York was amazing. Yeah. It's just great to be up there. Every corner bar has a little story. You know, you go in one place and they have like Old Bay wings. You don't like them? Go to a different bar. (laughs) They have one wing. It's got Old Bay on it. I'm like, I don't like Old Bay. Well, you can't have these wings. That's all we have. $5 well, I, per wing. You want like barbecue wings? They're Charlie's at the other corner. Right. It's so niche. Yeah. Like everything has its own thing. Yeah, if you don't like them, give a shit. There's a bar every corner. We actually also saw the Ghostbuster uh, oh, headquarters. Right. Yes. We walked up on that, saw it. We're taking pictures with it, and a fucking fire truck came out of it. Yeah, like, it's, it was, oh, it's an actual working it's firehouse. It's a working firehouse. All of so, so until we meet again, everybody, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Right. And for the With You Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. And I'm Scott. Cheers, everybody. (laughs) Later.